Section 15 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victor Guerrero. Selected Letters number 306 by Ludwig van Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 306 to Ehren Peters and Company Music Publishers, Leipzig Vienna, June 5th, 1822 Gentlemen, you did me the honor to address a letter to me at a time when I was much occupied. And I have also been extremely unwell for the last five months. I now only reply to the principal points. Although I met Steiner by chance a few days ago, and asked him jestingly what he had brought me from Leipzig, he did not make the smallest allusion to your commission or to yourself. He urged me, however, in the very strongest manner, to pledge myself to give him the exclusive right of publishing all my works, both present and future, and indeed to sign a contract to that effect which I declined. This trait sufficiently proves to you why I often give the preference to other publishers, both home and foreign. I love uprightness and integrity, and am of opinion that no one should drive a hard bargain with artists, for, alas, However brilliant the exterior of fame may appear, an artist does not enjoy the privilege of being the daily guest of Jupiter on Olympus. Unhappily commonplace humanity only too often unpleasantly drags him down from this pure ethereal height. The greatest work I have hitherto written is a grand mass with choruses and four obligati voice parts and full orchestra. Several persons have applied to me for this work, and I have been offered 100 louis d'or art cash for it, but I demand at least 1,000 florins CM, for which sum I will also furnish a pianoforte arrangement. Variations on a waltz for the piano, they are numerous, 30 ducats in gold, and B, Vienna ducats. With regard to songs, I have several rather important descriptive ones, as, for example, a comic aria with full orchestra on Goethe's text, Mit Meden sich vertragen, and another aria in the same style, 16 ducats each, furnishing also a pianoforte arrangement if required. Also several descriptive songs with pianoforte accompaniment, 12 ducats each. Among these is a little Italian cantata with recitative, there is also a song with recitative among the German ones. A song with pianoforte accompaniment, eight ducats. An elegy, four voices, with the accompaniment of two violins, viola and violoncello, 24 ducats. A dervice chorus with full orchestra, 20 ducats. Also the following instrumental music, a grand march for full orchestra with pianoforte accompaniment, 12 ducats, written for the tragedy of Tarpeia. Romance for the violin, a solo with full orchestra, 15 ducats. Grand third set for two oboes and one English horn, which might be arranged for other instruments, 30 ducats. Four military marches with Turkish music, when applied for, I will name the sum. Bagatelle, or minor pianoforte solos, the prize to be fixed when required. The above works are all completed. Solo pianoforte sonata, 40 ducats, which could soon be delivered. Quartet for two violins, tenor and violoncello, 50 ducats. This will also soon be ready. I am by no means so anxious about these, however, as about a full and complete edition of my works, being desirous to edit them during my lifetime. I have indeed received many proposals on this subject, but accompanied by stipulations to which I could scarcely agree, and which I neither could nor would fulfill. I am willing to undertake in the course of two years, or possibly a year, or a year and a half, with proper assistance, 
to edit and superintend a complete edition of my works and to furnish a new composition in each style, namely a new work in the style of variations, one in the sonata style, and so on in every separate class of work that I have ever composed, and for the whole combined I ask 10,000 florins cm. I am no man of business, and only wish I were. As it is, I am guided by the offers made to me by different competitors for my works, and such a competition is rather strong just now. I request you to say nothing on the subject, because, as you may perceive from the proceedings of these gentlemen, I am exposed to a great deal of annoyance. When once my works appear published by you, I shall no longer be plagued. I shall be very glad if a connection be established between us, having heard you so well spoken of. You will then also find that I infinitely prefer dealing with one person of your description than with a variety of people of the ordinary stamp. Pray, let me have an immediate answer, as I am now on the verge of deciding on the publication of various works. If you consider it worthwhile, be so good as to send me a duplicate of the list with which you furnished Herr Steiner. In the expectation of a speedy reply, I remain with esteem, your obedient Ludwig van Beethoven. End of letter number 306 End of section 15 of Selected Letters of Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Null and translated by Lady Grace Wallace Recording by Victor Guerreiro of Selected Letters of Beethoven this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Scott D. Farquhar. Selected Letters, number 426, by Ludwig von Beethoven. As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noel, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 426 To His Nephew I rejoice, my dear son, that you take pleasure in this new sphere, and such being the case, you must zealously strive to acquire what is necessary for it. I did not recognize your writing. I indeed look only to the sense and the meaning, but you must now attain some outward elegance also. If it is too hard a task for you to come here, give it up. But if you can by any possibility do so, I shall rejoice in my desert home to have a feeling heart near me. If you do come, the housekeeper will settle that you leave Vienna at five o'clock, which leaves you ample time for your studies. I embrace you cordially. Your attached father. P.S. Don't forget to bring the Morgenblatt and Reese's letter. Footnote 1. Footnote 1. A letter from Reese of this date in the Fischhoffsche Handschrift is of sufficient interest to be given here at full length. Godesburg, June 9, 1825. Dearest Beethoven, I returned a few days ago from Aix-la-Chapelle and feel the greatest pleasure in telling you that your new symphony, the Ninth, was executed with the most extraordinary precision, and received with the greatest applause. It was a hard nut to crack, and the last day I rehearsed the finale alone for three hours. But I, in particular, and all the others, were fully rewarded by the performance. It is a work beside which no other can stand, and had you written nothing but this, you would have gained immortality. Whither will you lead us? As it will interest you to hear something of the performance, I will now briefly describe it. The orchestra and the choruses consisted of 422 persons, and many very distinguished people among them. The first day commenced with a new symphony of mine, and afterwards Handel's Alexander's Feast, the second day began with your new symphony, followed by the Davide Penitente of Mozart, 
the overture to the Flato Magico, and the Mount of Olives. The applause of the public was almost terrific. I had been in Aix-la-Chapelle from the 3rd of May on purpose to conduct the rehearsals, and as a mark of the satisfaction and enthusiasm of the public, I was called forward at the close of the performance, when an ode and a laurel crown were presented to me by a lady, a very pretty one, too, and at the same moment another poem and a shower of flowers followed from the upper boxes. All was pleasure and contentment, and every one says that this is the finest of the seven Vitsuntide festivals held here. I cannot sufficiently lament that your other music arrived too late to make use of it. It was indeed utterly impossible to do so. I herewith send you, my dear friend, a check for forty Louis d'Or on Heppenmeyer and Company in Vienna, according to our arrangement, and beg you will acknowledge the receipt that I may settle everything relating to Aix-la-Chapelle. I am glad that you have not accepted any engagement in England. If you choose to reside there, you must previously take measures to ensure your finding your account in it. From the theater alone, Rossini got 2,500 pounds. If the English wish to do anything at all remarkable for you, they must combine, so that it may be well worth your while to go there. You are sure to receive enough of applause and marks of homage, but you have had plenty of these during your whole life. May all happiness attend you. Dear Beethoven, yours ever, Ferdinand Ries. End of letter number 426. End of section 16 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noel and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar, Baltimore, Maryland. www.splungemusic.com Seventeen of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters numbers 317, 318, 321, 325, 328 through 335, and 337 through 340 by Ludwig van Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 317 to Schindler My very best optimus optime. Pray try to hunt out a philanthropist who will advance me some money on a bank share, that I may not put the generosity of my friends too much to the test, nor myself be placed in difficulty by the delay of this money, for which I have to thank the fine plans and arrangements of my precious brother. You must not let it appear that this money is really wanted. End of letter number 317. Letter number 318. To Schindler. Dear Schindler, don't forget the bank share. It is greatly needed. It would be very annoying to be brought into court. Indeed, I would not be so for the whole world. My brother's conduct is quite worthy of him. The tailor is appointed to come to-day. Still, I hope to be able to get rid of him for the present by a few polite phrases. End of letter number 318. Letter number 321. To Schindler. Footnote 1. Dear Schindler, I am not sure whether the other copy was corrected or not, so I send you this one instead. As to N in S blank, I beg you not to say a word. B L is already very uneasy on the subject. In haste, your friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. We cannot understand what induced Beethoven, who lived in the same house with Schindler, to write to him, but he often did so to persons with whom he could easily have spoken, partly in order to get rid of the matter while it was in his thoughts, and also because he was a great deal from home, that is, going backwards and forwards from one lodging to another, having often several at the same time. End of letter number 321. Letter number 325 to Schindler. Imprimis. Papageno, not a word of what I said about Prussia. No reliance is to be placed on it. Martin Luther's table talk alone can be compared to it. I earnestly beg my brother also not to remove the padlock from his lips, and not to allow anything to transpire beyond the Zelchfurstgasse. Footnote 1. Finis. 
inquire of that arch churl Diabelli when the French copy of the Sonata in C minor, opus 111, is to be published. I stipulated to have five copies for myself, one of which is to be on fine paper, for the cardinal, note the Archduke Rudolph. If he attempts any of his usual impertinence on this subject, I will sing him, in person, a bass aria in his warehouse, which shall cause it and all the street, note Graben, to ring, footnote two. Footnote 1. Schindler relates, quote, The royal decision, note, to subscribe for a copy of the Mass, was brought to Beethoven by the Chancellor of the Embassy, Hofrat Wernhardt. Whether Prince Hatzfeld, note, the ambassador, made the following offer from his own impulse, or in consequence of a commission from Berlin, is not known. At all events, the Hofrat put this question in the name of the Prince to the great composer, quote, Whether he would be disposed to prefer a royal order to the fifty ducats. End quote. Note the sum demanded for the mass. Beethoven replied at once, quote, the fifty ducats. End quote. Scarcely had the chancellor left the room when Beethoven, in considerable excitement, indulged in all kinds of sarcastic remarks on the manner in which many of his contemporaries hunted after orders and decorations, these being, in his estimation, generally gained at the cost of the sanctity of art. End quote. Footnote two. Schindler relates that Diabelli had refused to let Beethoven again have the manuscript of the sonata, which he had repeatedly sent for when in the hands of the engraver, in order to correct and improve it. Diabelli, therefore, coolly submitted to all of this abuse of the enraged composer, and wrote to him that he would note down the threatened bass aria and publish it, but would give him the usual gratuity for it, and that Beethoven had better come to see him. On this, Beethoven said no more. This sonata is dedicated to the Archduke Rudolf, and is also published by Schlesinger. End of letter number 325. Letter number 328. Footnote 1. To Schindler. Hetzendorf, 1823. Samothracian vagabond. Footnote 2. You must hunt out from Schlemmer, note the copyist, what is still wanting in the Kyrie. Show him the postscript, and so, satis, no more of such a wretch. Farewell. Arrange everything. I am to bind up my eyes at night, and to spare them as much as possible. Otherwise, says Smetna, I shall write little more music in the time to come. Footnote 1. Quote, we arrived at Hetzendorf on May 17th, end quote, is written by Karl in Beethoven's notebook of 1823, and on this note is written in the scamp's hand, Hetzendorf, 1823. Footnote 2. Quote, by the word Samothracian, Beethoven alludes to the Samothracian mysteries, partly grounded on music. Their mutual participation in the Beethoven mysteries is intended to be thus indicated. Among the initiated were also Brunswick, Lishnowski, and Smeskel. End quote. Note from a note of Schindler's on the subject. End of letter number 328. Letter number 329 to Schindler. Hetzendorf, 1823, question mark. Pray forward the packet to-day, and inquire this afternoon, if possible, about the housekeeper in the Glockengasse, number 318, third étage. She is a widow, understands cookery, and is willing to serve merely for board and lodging, to which, of course, I cannot consent, or only under certain conditions. My present one is too shameful. I cannot invite you here, but be assured of my gratitude. End of letter number 329. Letter number 330. To Schindler, footnote 1. Hetzendorf, 1823. I enclose the letter to Herr von Abraskov, note, chargé d'affaires of the Russian legation. As soon as I receive the money, I will immediately send you fifty florins for your trouble, not a word more than is absolutely necessary. I have advertised your house. You can mention, merely as a casual remark at the right moment, that France also remitted the money to you. Never forget that such persons represent majesty itself. Footnote 1. Louis the Eighth sent a gold medal for his subscription copy of the Mass on February 20th, 1824. End of letter number 330. Letter number 331 to Schindler. I beg you will kindly write out the enclosed invitation neatly for me on the paper I send you, for Karl has too much to do. I wish to dispatch it early on Wednesday. I want to know where Grillparzer lives. Perhaps I may pay him a visit myself. Footnote 1. You must have a little patience about the fifty florins, as yet it is impossible for me to send them, for which you are as much to blame as I am. Footnote 1. It is well known that in the winter of 1822-23, to 23, Beethoven was engaged in the composition of an opera for the Royal Theatre, for which purpose Grillparzer had given him his Melusina. 
End of letter number 331. Letter number 332 to Schindler. I send K's, note, Katniss, book, note, libretto. Except the first act, which is rather insipid, it is written in such a masterly style that it does not by any means require a first-rate composer. I will not say that on this very account it would be the more suitable for me. Still, if I can get rid of previous engagements, who knows what may or will happen. Please acknowledge the receipt of this. End of letter number 332. Letter number 333. To Schindler. I wish to know about Esterhazy, and also about the post. A letter carrier from the Mauer, note, a place near Hetzendorf, was here. I only hope the message has been properly delivered. Nothing as yet from Dresden, note, see number 330. I mean to ask you to dine with me a few days hence, for I still suffer from my weak eyes. Today, however, for the first time they seem to improve, but I scarcely dare make any use of them as yet. Your friend, Beethoven. P.S. As for the Tokai, footnote one, it is better adapted for summer than for autumn, and also for some fiddler who could respond to its noble fire, and yet stand firm as a rock. Footnote one. A musical friend had sent the maestro six bottles of genuine Tokai, expressing his wish that it might tend to restore his strength. Schindler, he says, wrote to Beethoven at Hetzendorf to tell him of this, and received the above answer, and the order through Frau Schnapps to do as he pleased with the wine. He sent one bottle of it to Hetzendorf, but Beethoven at that time had inflamed eyes. End of letter number 333. Letter number 334. To Schindler. I cannot at present accept these tempting invitations, note from Zontag and Unger. So far as my weak eyes permit, I am very busy, and when it is fine I go out. I will myself thank these two fair ladies for their amiability. No tidings from Dresden. I shall wait till the end of this month and then apply to a lawyer in Dresden. I will write about Schoberlechner tomorrow. End of letter number 334. Letter number 335 to Schindler. June 18th, 1823. You ought to have perfectly well known that I would have nothing to do with the affair in question. With regard to my being liberal, I think I have shown you that I am so on principle. Indeed, I suspect you must have observed that I even have gone beyond these principles. Sapienci sat. Footnote 1. Footnote 1. Franz Schoberlechner, pianist in Vienna, wrote to Beethoven on June 25, 1823, to ask him for letters of introduction to Leipzig, Dresden, Berlin, and Russia, etc., the maestro, however, wrote across the letter, quote, An active fellow requires no other recommendation than from one respectable family to another, end quote, and gave it back to Schindler, who showed it to Schoberlechner, and no doubt at his desire urged Beethoven to comply with his request. Beethoven, however, did not know Schoberlechner, and had no very high opinion of him, as he played chiefly bravura pieces, and besides, on the bills of his concerts, he pompously paraded all his titles, decorations, and as members of various societies, which gave ample subject for many a sarcastic remark on the part of Beethoven. End of letter number 335. Letter number 337 to Schindler. Hetzendorf, July 1st, 1823. I am myself writing to Wocher, note, cabinet courier to Prince Esterhazy, question mark, number 333, and for more speed I send by Karl, who chances to be driving in, the application to Prince E. Be so good as to inquire the result. I doubt its being favourable, not expecting much kindly feeling on his part towards me, judging from former days. Footnote 1. I believe that female influence alone ensures success with him in such matters. At all events, I now know, by your obliging inquiries, how I can safely write to this Schultz. The bad weather, and more especially the bad atmosphere, prevented my paying her, note, Countess Schafgott, a visit about this affair. Footnote 2. Your amicus, Beethoven. P.S. Nothing yet from Dresden. Schlemmer, note, the copyist, has just been here again asking for money. I have now advanced him seventy gulden. Speculations are for commercial men, and not for poor devils like myself. Hitherto the sole fruit of this unlucky speculation, note a subscription for his mass, are only more debts. You have no doubt seen that the Gloria is completed. If my eyes were only strong again, so that I could resume my writing, I should do well enough. Note, written on the cover. Are the variations, note, opus 120, sent off yet to London? Nota bene, 
So far as I can remember, it was not mentioned in the application to Prince Esterhazy that the mass was to be delivered in manuscript only. What mischief may ensue from this? I suspect that such was the intention of Herr Artaria in proposing to present the mass gratis to the prince, as it would give Artaria an opportunity for the third time to steal one of my works. Volker's attention must be called to this. Of course, there is nothing obligatory on Papageno in the matter. Footnote 1 Beethoven wrote the Mass in C for him in the year 1807, which was by no means satisfactory to the prince when performed at Eisenstadt in the year following, and conducted by Beethoven himself. Footnote 2. Schultz, music director at Warmbrunn in Silesia, had written a German text for the Mass in C. Beethoven also wished to have from him a German translation from the Latin words adapted to the music of the Grand Mass. Schindler says that the words, quote, prevented my visiting her, end quote, refer to Countess Schafgotsch, whom Beethoven wished to see on account of Schultz, who unhappily died in the ensuing year. His text, however, is given in the Cecilia, 23 through 54. End of letter number 337. Letter number 338. To Pilat, editor of the Austrian Observer. Sir, I shall feel highly honoured if you will be so good as to mention in your esteemed journal my nomination as an honorary member of the Royal Swedish Musical Academy. Although neither vain nor ambitious, still I consider it advisable not wholly to pass over such an occurrence, as in practical life we must live and work for others, who may often eventually benefit by it. Forgive my intrusion, and let me know if I can in any way serve you in return, which it would give me much pleasure to do." I am, sir, with high consideration, your obedient Beethoven. End of letter number 338. Letter number 339 to Schindler. Hetzendorf, July, 1823. Most worthy ragamuffin of Epirus and Brundusium. Give this letter to the editor of the Observer, but write the address on it first. Ask him at the same time whether his daughter makes great progress on the piano, and if I can be of any use to her by sending her a copy of one of my compositions. I wrote that I was an honorary member. I don't know, however, whether this is correct. Perhaps I ought to have said a corresponding member, neither knowing nor caring much about such things. You had also better say something on the subject to Bernardum non sanctum, note, editor of the Vienna Zeitschrift. Make inquiries, too, from Bernard, about that knave Ruprecht. Tell him of this queer business, and find out from him how he can punish the villain. Ask both these philosophical newspaper scribes whether this may be considered an honourable or dishonourable nomination. End of letter number 339. Letter number 340 to Schindler. Master flash in the pan and wide of the mark, full of reasons yet devoid of reason. Everything was ready yesterday for Glazer. Note the copyist. As for you, I shall expect you in Hetzendorf to dinner at half past two o'clock. If you come later, dinner shall be kept for you. End of letter number three hundred forty. End of section seventeen of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Section 18 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters, numbers 341 through 344, 349, 358 through 360, 363, 368, 370 through 374, 400, 467, and 474, by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 341, to Schindler. Hetzendorf, July 2nd, 1823. Worthy Herr V. Schindler, the incessant insolence of my landlord from the hour I entered his house up to the present moment compels me to apply for aid to the police. So I beg you will do so for me at once. As to the double winter windows, the housekeeper was desired to see about them, and especially to state if they were not necessary after such a violent storm, in case of the rain having penetrated into the room. 
but her report was that the rain had not come in, and, moreover, that it could not possibly do so. In accordance with her statement, I locked the door to prevent this rude man entering my room during my absence, which he had threatened. Say also, further, what his conduct to you was, and that he put up a placard of the lodgings being to let, without giving me notice, which, besides, he has no right to do till St. James's Day. He is equally unfair in refusing to give up the receipt from St. George's Day till St. James's, as the enclosure shows. I am charged, too, for lighting, of which I know nothing." This detestable lodging, footnote one, without any open stove, and the principal flue truly abominable, has cost me, for extra outlay exclusive of the rent, two hundred fifty-nine florins, in order merely to keep me alive while I was there during the winter. It was a deliberate fraud, as I never was allowed to see the rooms on the first floor, but only those on the second, that I might not become aware of their many disagreeable drawbacks. I cannot understand how a flu so destructive to health can be tolerated by the government. You remember the appearance of the walls of your room owing to smoke, and the large sum it cost even to lessen in any degree this discomfort, although to do away with it wholly was impossible. My chief anxiety at present is that he may be ordered to take down his placard, and to give me a receipt for the house-rent I have paid." but nothing will induce me to pay for the abominable lighting, without which it cost me enough actually to preserve my life in such a lodging. My eyes do not yet suffer me to encounter the town atmosphere, or I would myself apply in person to the police. You're attached, Beethoven. Footnote 1. The Fargasse in the Leimgrube, where Schindler lived with him. End of letter number 341. Letter number 342 to Schindler. I must have an attested copy of all the writings. I send you forty-five kreutzers. How could you possibly accept such a proposal from our churlish landlord when accompanied by a threat? Where was your good sense? Where it always is. Tomorrow early I shall send for the variations, copy and originals. It is not certain whether the PR comes or not, so be so good as to stay at home till eight o'clock. You can come to dinner either to-day or to-morrow, but you must settle which you mean to do, as it is not easy for me to provide provisions. Not later than half-past two o'clock. The housekeeper will tell you about a lodging in the Landstrasse. It is high time, truly. As soon as you hear of anything to be had on the Bastei or the Landstrasse, you must at once give me notice. We must find out what room the landlord uses, on account of the well. Vale. End of letter number 342. Letter number 343. To Schindler, footnote 1. Hetzendorf, 1823. Samothracian vagabond! You were dispatched yesterday to the South Pole, whereas we went off to the North Pole, a slight difference now equalized by Captain Perry. There were, however, no mashed potatoes there. Bach, note, his lawyer, to whom I beg my best regards, is requested to say what the lodging in Baden is to cost. We must also try to arrange that Carl should come to me once every fortnight there, but cheaply, good heavens, poverty and economy. I entrust this matter to you, as you have your friends and admirers among the drivers and liverymen. If you get this in time, you had better go to Bach to-day, so that I may receive his answer to-morrow forenoon. It is almost too late now. You might also take that rascal of a copyist by surprise. I don't expect much good from him. He has now had the variations for eight days. Your, note, friend, stroked out, Amicus Beethoven. Footnote 1. He no doubt alludes to Captain Perry, the celebrated traveller, who wrote an article in the A.M. Zeitung on the music of the Eskimo. End of letter number 343. Letter number 344. To Schindler. Footnote 1. June, 1823. Samothracian, don't trouble yourself to come here till you receive a hati sharif. I must say you do not deserve the golden cord. My fast-sailing frigate, the worthy and well-born Frau Schnapps, will call every three or four days to inquire after your health. Farewell. Bring no one whatever with you. Farewell. Footnote 1. Schindler says in his biography, quote, these variations, note, Opus 120, were completed in June 1823, and delivered to the publisher Diabelli, without the usual amount of time bestowed on giving them the finishing touches. 
and now he set to work at once on the Ninth Symphony, some jottings of which were already written down. Forthwith, all the gay humour that had made him more sociable, and in every respect more accessible, at once disappeared. All visits were declined, end quote, etc. End of letter number 344. Letter number 349 to Schindler. August 1823. You Samothracian villain! Make haste and come, for the weather is just right. Better early than late. Presto, prestissimo! We are to drive from here. Footnote 1. Footnote 1. Beethoven had apartments in a summer residence of Baron Prones on his beautiful property at Hetzendorf. Suddenly, however, the maestro, deeply immersed in the Ninth Symphony, was no longer satisfied with this abode, because, quote, the baron would persist in making him profound bows every time that he met him, end quote. So, with the help of Schindler and Frau Schnapps, he removed to Baden in August, 1823. End of letter number 349. Letter number 358 to Schindler. Baden, September, 1823. Signore Papageno, that your scandalous reports may no longer distress the poor Dresdener, I must tell you that the money reached me today, accompanied by every possible mark of respect to myself. Though I should have been happy to offer you a substantial acknowledgment for the, note, illegible, effaced by Schindler, you have shown me, I cannot yet accomplish to the full extent what I have so much at heart. I hope to be more fortunate some weeks hence. Note, see number 329. Per il Signore Nobile, Papageno Schindler. End of letter number 358. Letter number 359 to Schindler, 1823. The occurrence that took place yesterday, which you will see in the police reports, is only too likely to attract the notice of the established police to this affair. The testimony of a person whose name is not given entirely coincides with yours. In such a case, private individuals cannot act. The authorities alone are empowered to do so. Footnote 1. Yours, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Schindler says, quote, Brother Johann the apothecary was ill in the summer of 1823, and during that time his disreputable wife visited her lover, an officer, in the barracks, and was often seen walking with him in the most frequented places, besides receiving him in her own house. Her husband, though confined to bed, could see her adorning herself to go in search of amusement with her admirer. Beethoven, who was informed of this scandal from various quarters, appealed vigorously to his brother, in the hope of persuading him to separate from his ill-conducted wife, but failed in his attempt, owing to the indolence of this ill-regulated man. End quote. It was Schindler, too, who prevented Beethoven making any further application to the police. The following note probably refers to this. In his notebook of November 1823 is a canon written by Beethoven on his brother Johann and his family, on these words, quote, Fett Lümmel Bankert haben triumphiert, end quote. No doubt an allusion to the disgraceful incident we have mentioned. Brother Johann's wife had a very lovely daughter before she married him. End of letter number 359. Letter number 360 to Schindler. Wiseacre, I kiss the hem of your garment. End of letter number 360. Letter number 363 to Schindler. 1824. Frau S. Note, schnapps, will provide what is required, so come to dinner today at two o'clock. I have good news to tell you, footnote one, but this is quite entre nous, for the brain-eater, note, his brother Johann, must know nothing about it. Footnote one. This no doubt refers to a letter from Prince Galizin, March 11th, 1824. Quote, I beg you will be so good as to let me know when I may expect the quartet, which I await with the utmost impatience. If you require money, I request you will draw on Monsieur Stieglitz and Company in St. Petersburg for the sum you wish to have, and it will be paid to your order. End, quote. End of letter number 363. Letter number 368 to Herr Schindler. Do not come to me till I summon you. No concert. Beethoven. End of letter number 368. Letter number 370 to Schindler. 1824. 
If you have any information to give me, pray write it down, but seal the note for which purpose you will find wax and a seal on my table. Let me know where Dupont, footnote one, lives, when he is usually to be met with, and whether I could see him alone, or if it is probable that people will be there, and who. I feel far from well. Portez-vous bien. I am still hesitating whether to speak to Dupont or write to him, which I cannot do without bitterness. Do not wait dinner for me. I hope you will enjoy it. I do not intend to come, being ill from our bad fare of yesterday. A flask of wine is ready for you. Footnote 1. Schindler says that on April 24, 1824, he applied to Dupont, at that time administrator of the Kantnotor Theater, in Beethoven's name, to sanction his giving a grand concert there, allowing him to have the use of the house for the sum of 400 florins C.M., Further, that the conducting of the concert should be entrusted to Umlauf and Schupanzich, and the solos to Mesdames Unger and Zontag, and to the bass singer Preisinger. End of letter number 370. Letter number 371, footnote 1, to Schindler. To Schindler, I beg you will come to see me tomorrow, as I have a tale to tell you as sour as vinegar. Dupart said yesterday that he had written to me, though I have not yet got his letter, but he expressed his satisfaction, which is best of all. The chief feat, however, is not yet performed, that which is to be acted in front of the proscenium. Note, in Beethoven's writing, Yours from C-sharp below to high F, Beethoven. Footnote 1, written by his nephew. End of letter number 371. Letter number 372, to Schindler. After six weeks of discussion, here, there, and everywhere, I am fairly boiled, stewed, and roasted. What will be the result of this much-talked-of concert if the prices are not raised? What shall I get in return for all my outlay, as the copying alone costs so much? End of letter number 372. Letter number 373 to Schindler. At twelve o'clock today, quote, in die Birne, end quote, note, an inn on the Landstrasse, thirsty and hungry, then to the coffee-house, back again here, and straight to Penzing, or I shall lose the lodging. End of letter number 373. Letter number 374, to Schindler. When you write to me, write exactly as I do to you, without any formal address or signature. Vita brevis ars longa. No necessity for details, only the needful. End of letter number 374. Letter number 400, to Schindler. The Spring of 1825. I have waited till half-past one o'clock, but, as the caput confusum has not come, I know nothing of what is likely to happen. Karl must be off to the university in the Prater, so I am obliged to go, that Karl, who must leave this early, may have his dinner first. I am to be found in the, quote, Wilde Mann, end quote, an inn in the Prater. To Herr Schindler, Moravian numbskull, Footnote 1. Footnote 1. Schindler was a Moravian. End of letter number 400. Letter number 467 to Schindler. The end of February 1827. When we meet, we can discuss the mischance that has befallen you. I can send you some person without the smallest inconvenience. Do accept my offer. It is at least something. Have you had no letters from Moscolese or Kramer? There will be a fresh occasion for writing on Wednesday, and once more urging my project. If you are still indisposed at that time, one of my people can take the letter, and get a receipt from the post office. Vale et fave. I need not assure you of my sympathy with your misfortune. Pray, allow me to supply board for you in the meantime. I offer this from my heart. May heaven preserve you. Your sincere friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 467. Letter number 474, footnote 1, to Schindler, March 17th, 1827. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful! Both the learned gentlemen are defeated, and I shall be saved solely by Malfatti's skill. You must come to me for a few minutes without fail this forenoon. Yours, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Schindler dates this note March 17, 1827, and says that these are the last lines Beethoven ever wrote. They certainly were the last that he wrote to Schindler. 
On the back of the note, in another writing, probably Schindler's, the receipt is given in pencil for the bath with hay steeped in it, ordered by Malfatti, which the poor invalid thought had saved his life. The, quote, learned gentlemen, end quote, are Dr. Vavruch and the surgeon Zybert, who had made the punctures. End of letter number 474. End of section 18 of Selected Letters of Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. To Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters, Numbers 39, 278 through 280, 295, 296, 298, and 309, by Ludwig von Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter Number 39, to Messrs. Artaria and Company, Footnote 1, Vienna, June 1st, 1805. I must inform you that the affair about the new quintet is settled between Count Fries and myself. The Count has just assured me that he intends to make you a present of it. It is too late today for a written agreement on the subject, but one shall be sent early in the ensuing week. This intelligence must suffice for the present, and I think I, at all events, deserve your thanks for it. Your obedient servant, Ludwig van Beethoven. Footnote 1. The quintet is probably not that in C, Opus 29, dedicated to Count von Fries, previously published in 1803 by Breitkopf and Hertel, see number 27. It is more likely that he alludes to a new quintet, which the Count had no doubt ordered. End of letter number 39. Letter number 278. To Herr Artaria, Vienna. October 1st, 1819. Most excellent and most virtuous of virtuosi, and no humbug, while informing you of all sorts of things from which we hope you will draw the best conclusions, we request you to send us six, say six, copies of the Sonata in B-flat major, and also six copies of the variations on the Scotch songs, as the authors write. We beg you to forward them to Steiner and Paternoster Gesell, whence they will be sent to us with some other things. In the hope that you are conducting yourself with all due propriety and decorum, we are your, etc., B. End of letter number 278. Letter number 279. A sketch written by Beethoven, corrected by Artaria's bookkeeper, Wuster. 1819. Having heard from Herr B. that your Royal Highness, the Archduke Rudolph, has written a most masterly work, we wish to be the first to have the great honor of publishing your Royal Highness's composition, that the world may become acquainted with the admirable talents of so illustrious a prince. We trust your royal highness will comply with our respectful solicitation. Falstaff, footnote one, ragged rascal. Footnote one, the name Beethoven gave to Artaria's partner, Bolderini. End of letter number 279. Letter number 280 to Artaria. Mödling, October 12, 1819. Pray forgive me, dear A, for plaguing you as follows. We are coming to town the day after tomorrow, and expect to arrive at four o'clock. The two days festival compels us to return the same day, as Karl must prepare with his master here for the second examination, these very holidays enabling the tutor to devote more time to him. But I must soon return to town on account of the certificate of Karl's birth, which costs more time and money than I like. I at all times dislike traveling by the diligence, and this one has moreover one peculiarity, that you may wish to go on what day you please, but it always turns out to be a Friday on which it sets off. And, though a good Christian, still one Friday in the year is sufficient for me. I beg you will request the leader of the choir, the devil alone knows what the office is, to be so good as to give us Carl's certificate of birth on the afternoon of the same day, if possible. He might do so at seven o'clock in the morning, at the time we arrive, but he ought to be punctual, for Carl is to appear at the examination at half-past seven o'clock. So it must be either tomorrow at seven, or at all events in the afternoon. We shall call on you tomorrow before seven o'clock to inquire about this, with the proviso of a visit later in the day. In haste, and asking your pardon, your L. von Beethoven. 
End of letter number 280. Letter number 295. To Herr Artaria, Falstaff, and Company. Vienna, October 26th, 1820. I politely request that you will hand over to Herr Oliva the sum of 300 florins, which has no doubt already been received by you in full. Having been entirely occupied by removing to my new lodgings, I could not do myself the honor of expressing my thanks to you and Sir John Falstaff in person. Your obedient servant, Ludwig V. Beethoven. End of letter number 295. Letter number 296. To Boldrini. My very worthy Falstaff, I request with all due civility that you will send me a copy of each of the two works for pianoforte and flute, with variations. As for the receipt, you shall have it to-morrow, and I also beg you will forward it forthwith. Give my compliments to Herr Artaria, and thank him from me for his kind offer of an advance, but as I have received from abroad the money due to me, I do not require to avail myself of his aid. Farewell, Knight Falstaff. Do not be too dissipated. Read the gospel, and be converted. We remain your well-affected Beethoven. To Sir John Falstaff, Knight, to the care of Herr Artaria and Company. End of letter number 296. Letter number 298. To Herr Artaria and Company. Vienna, December 17th, 1820. I thank you warmly for the advance of 150 florins, for which I have made out the receipt in the name of His Imperial Highness the Cardinal, and I beg, as I am in danger of losing one of my bank shares, that you will advance me another 150 florins, which I pledge myself to repay within three months at latest from this date. As a proof of my gratitude, I engage in this letter to make over to you, as your exclusive property, one of my compositions, consisting of two or more movements, without claiming payment for it hereafter. Your ever complacent, Beethoven, L.S. End of letter number 298. Letter number 309. To Herr Artaria. August 22nd, 1822. Being overwhelmed with work, I can only briefly say that I will always do what I can to repay your obliging kindness to me. With regard to the Mass, I have been offered 1,000 florins CM for it. My circumstances do not permit me to accept a less sum from you. All that I can do is to give you the preference. Rest assured that I do not ask you one farthing more than others have offered me, which I can prove to you by written documents. You can consider about this, but I must request you to send me an answer on the subject tomorrow, it being a post-day, and my decision expected elsewhere. With regard to the 150 florins for which I am your debtor, I intend to make you a proposal, as I stand in great need of the 1,000 florins. I beg you will observe strict secrecy as to the Mass. Now, as ever, your grateful friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 309. End of section 19 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. Recording by Sean Dougal. www.electromonkeymedia.com Section 20 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar. Selected Letters, Numbers 42, 167, 168, 228, 229, 230, and 255, by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noel, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 42. Testimonial for C. Cherney. Vienna, December 7, 1805. I, the undersigned, am glad to bear testimony to young Carl Cherney having made the most extraordinary progress on the pianoforte, far beyond what might be expected at the age of fourteen. I consider him deserving of all possible assistance, not only from what I have already referred to, but from his astonishing memory, and more especially from his parents having spent all their means in cultivating the talent of their promising son. Ludwig van Beethoven End of letter number 42 Letter number 167 To Cherney Footnote 1 My dear Cherney, Pray give the enclosed to your parents for the dinners the boy had recently at your house. 
I positively will not accept these gratis. Moreover, I am very far from wishing that your lessons should remain without remuneration. Even those already given must be reckoned up and paid for. Only I beg you to have a little patience for a time, as nothing can be demanded from the widow, and I had and still have heavy expenses to defray. But I borrow from you for the moment only. The boy is to be with you today, and I shall come later. Your friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Carl Cherney, the celebrated pianist and composer for whom Beethoven wrote a testimonial in 1805. See number 42. He gave lessons to Beethoven's nephew in 1815 and naturally protested against any payment, which gave rise to the expressions on the subject in many of his notes to Cherney, of which there appear to be a great number. End of letter number 167. Letter number 168. To Cherney. Footnote 1. Vienna, February 12th, 1816. Dear Cherney, I cannot see you today, but I will call tomorrow, being desirous to talk to you. I spoke out so bluntly yesterday that I much regretted it afterwards. But you must forgive this on the part of an author who would have preferred hearing his work as he wrote it, however charmingly you played it. I will, however, amply atone for this by the violoncello sonata. Footnote 2 Rest assured that I cherish the greatest regard for you as an artist, and I shall always endeavor to prove this. Your true friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Cherny, in the A. M. Zeitung, 1845, relates, On one occasion, in 1812, at Schapanzig's concert, when playing Beethoven's quintet with wind instruments, I took the liberty, in my youthful levity, to make many alterations such as introducing difficulties into the passages, making use of the upper octaves, etc., etc. Beethoven sternly and deservedly reproached me for this in the presence of Schopanzig, Linke, and the other performers. Footnote 2. Opus 69, which Cherny, C. A. M. Zeitung, was to perform with Linke the following week. End of letter number 168. Letter number 228. To Cherney. Dear Cherney, I beg you will treat Carl with as much patience as possible, for though he does not as yet get on quite as you and I could wish, still I fear he will soon do even less, because, though I do not want him to know it, he is over-fatigued by the injudicious distribution of his lesson hours. Unluckily, it is not easy to alter this, so pray, however strict you may be, show him every indulgence, which will, I am sure, have also a better effect on Carl under such unfavorable circumstances. With respect to his playing with you, when he has finally acquired the proper mode of fingering and plays in right time and gives the notes with tolerable correctness, you must only then first direct his attention to the mode of execution, and when he is sufficiently advanced, do not stop his playing on account of little mistakes, but only point them out at the end of the piece. Although I have myself given very little instruction, I have always followed this system, which quickly forms a musician. And this is, after all, one of the first objects of art, and less fatiguing both to master and scholar. In certain passages, like the following... I wish all the fingers to be used, and also in similar ones, such as these. So that they may go very smoothly. Such passages can indeed be made to sound very perle, or like a pearl, played by fewer fingers, but sometimes we wish for a different kind of jewel. Footnote 1. More as to this some other time. I hope that you will receive these suggestions in the same kindly spirit in which they are offered and intended. In any event, I am, and ever must remain, your debtor. May my candor serve as a pledge of my wish to discharge this debt at some future day. Your true friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. 
Carl Cherney relates in the Vienna A. M. Zeitung of 1845, number 113, as follows. Beethoven came to me usually every day himself with the boy, and used to say to me, You must not think that you please me by making Carl play my works. I am not so childish as to wish anything of the kind. Give him whatever you think best. I named Clementi. Yes, yes, said he, Clementi is very good indeed. And, added he, laughing, give Carl occasionally what is according to rule, that he may hereafter come to what is contrary to rule. After a hit of this sort, which he introduced into almost every speech, he used to burst into a loud peal of laughter, having in the earlier part of his career been often reproached by the critics with his irregularities, he was in the habit of alluding to this with gay humor. End of letter number 228. Letter number 229. To Cherney. Dear Cherney, I beg you will say nothing on that particular subject at Giannatasio's, who dined with us on the day you were so good as to call on me. He requested this himself. I will tell you the reason when we meet. I hope to be able to prove my gratitude for your patience with my nephew, that I may not always remain your debtor. In haste, your friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 229. Letter number 230. To Cherney. Dear Cherney, can you in any way assist the man I now send to you, a pianoforte maker and tuner from Baden, in selling his instruments? Though small in size, their manufacture is solid. In haste, your friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 230. Letter number 255. To Cherney. My dear, good, kind Cherney. Footnote 1. I have this moment heard that you are in a position I really never suspected. You might certainly place confidence in me and point out how matters could be made better for you, without any pretensions to patronage on my part. As soon as I have a moment to myself, I must speak to you. Rest assured that I highly value you, and am prepared to prove this at any moment by deeds. Yours with sincere esteem, L. von Beethoven. Footnote 1. Zellner, in his Blatter für Musik, relates what follows on Cherny's own authority. In 1818, Cherny was requested by Beethoven in a letter, which he presented some years ago to Cox, the London music publisher, to play at one of his last concerts in the large Redoutensaal, his E-flat major concerto, opus 73. Cherney answered, in accordance with the truth, that having gained his livelihood entirely for many years past by giving lessons on the piano for more than twelve hours daily, he had so completely laid aside his pianoforte playing that he could not venture to attempt playing the concerto properly within the course of a few days, which Beethoven desired, on which he received, in the above letter, a touching proof of Beethoven's sympathy. He also learned subsequently that Beethoven had exerted himself to procure him a permanent situation. End of letter number 255. End of section 20 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar. Baltimore, Maryland. www.splungemusic.com.